All right, my name is Jeremy Gatalka. I'm an ICU doctor and current critical care ultrasound fellow. I'm going to be talking today about cardiac assessment using ultrasound in shock. The first thing we'll talk about is machine setup. If you happen to be using the Sonosite export like we are today, this is the first screen you're going to encounter. You may want to enter patient information if you have image archiving software. For now, we'll just go straight to transducer selection. So we'll hit select. It's important to verify that you've actually selected the cardiac probe. So the label on the probe should correspond to the screen here. So we're going to select the P21 on cardiac preset. Push scan and you're good to go. When assessing a patient with shock in the ICU using echo, it's important to have a standardized approach that's somewhat um, congruent from patient to patient. The first view we're going to start with by convention is the parasternal long axis view. We're going to start off with generous depth selected on the machine, which can be changed using this slider on the left side of the screen here. I'm going to start at about 23 centimeters, and I'm going to put my transducer down on the patient's chest with the probe marker angulated towards his right shoulder. I'm going to start fairly high in the chest, roughly at the level of the second intercostal space, with my transducer angulated downwards towards his hips. I'm going to slide down one rib space at a time until cardiac structures come into view. I initially want a large amount of depth so that I can assess for deep structures such as a pericardial effusion or a pleural effusion in the chest. These will appear in the deep field with a pericardial effusion appearing just under the inferior wall of the heart and tracking in front of the descending aorta, which is the circular structure here. A pleural effusion will be on the other side of the descending aorta. Once I'm able to see that there's no significant effusion there, I'm going to optimize my depth so that the structures of interest, mainly the left ventricle, are in the center of the screen. So I'm going to use this slider to back up my depth until I've got a nice centered image. Now I'm going to try to clean up the image so that I've got a perfect view of the structures I'm interested in. An ideal parasternal long axis view is going to consist of the septal and inferior walls of the left ventricle running more or less parallel across the screen without any view of the apex. I also want to be able to see the mitral valve and the aortic valve in cross section at the same time. Okay, good. Once I've got my view optimized on the screen, I'm going to turn my attention to the left ventricular function. In the setting of shock, I'm most concerned about severe left ventricular dysfunction as a cause of hypotension. There's a few objective or quantitative findings I can look at to characterize whether or not I think that there's evidence of LV systolic dysfunction. The first and most obvious thing is going to be fractional shortening of the left ventricular cavity. I'm going to get my cavity, uh, my left ventricle in view such that I can see the inner walls of the myocardium, the endocardium. And I'm going to look at the change in separation between the inferior and septal walls. I want to see approximately 30% uh, fractional shortening of the chamber. The key in this is to make sure that you're, seeing, you're visualizing the endocardium to assess the, the change in the chamber dimension. So here we can see that in this healthy patient, there's quite adequate um, fractional shortening of the left ventricular cavity. The next thing I'm going to turn my attention to is the wall thickness. During systole, there should be significant thickening of both the septal wall and the inferior wall. I should see about a 50% increase in the width of those walls. And again, in this healthy patient, that's notable here. The final thing that can be helpful sometimes is something called the endpoint septal separation, or EPSS. That's an assessment of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and how closely that leaflet approximates the septum during diastole. At its point of closest approach it, in a healthy person, that anterior mitral valve leaflet should come almost up to the septum, the so-called septal slap. Uh, in reality, a, a separation of less than five millimeters is considered to be normal. And I'll also mention at this time that if you have a intrinsic mitral valve disease like mitral stenosis, the abnormal leaflet motion will be due to that and not necessarily due to ventricular dysfunction. Once I've assessed these things in the uh, parasternal long axis view, I'm going to rotate my transducer by 90 degrees to cut through the left ventricle on short axis. In order to do that, I'm going to use my left hand to keep the transducer oriented over the heart 
and I'm going to use my right hand to just rotate the transducer so that the probe marker is now facing towards his left shoulder. Once I've got the basic alignment with the transducer, I'm going to optimize the image on the screen. What I want to see is the left ventricle shaped like a ring with the two papillary muscles visible at the same time. I'm just sliding the transducer towards and away from the sternum and the rib space and um, rocking my probe a little bit to try and get a good window here. So I've managed to achieve what looks like a reasonable view of the left ventricle in short axis, but things are a little bit dark, so I'm just going to increase the gain on the screen a bit, and this helps me to bring out some structures. So as I change my, the tilt of my probe towards the base of the heart, I can see the mitral valve in the fish mouth view. So I'm going to angulate the probe a little bit more towards the apex, and now I can see the pap muscles very clearly. In this view, I'm looking at some of the same things as the long axis. I want to see that the uh, chamber I'm able to see uh, is changing by about 30 to 50 percent during systole, and I also want to see that the walls are thickening nicely during systole. In this case, you can see that in this healthy person, the walls thicken normally and the cavity actually changes in its dimensions appropriately during systole. This is an excellent view as well to observe the interdependence between the left and right ventricles. The right ventricle is on the uh, on my left side of the screen, and in a normal patient will look like a crescent that's notably smaller than the left ventricular cavity. The septum should be rounded such that it deviates towards the right ventricle throughout the cardiac cycle. Uh, in patients who have significant right ventricular pressure or volume overload, the septum can actually shift inwards, flattening and then actually curving inwards towards the left ventricle. Once I've made my assessment here, I'm going to finish with the parasternal views for now and switch over to the apical views. In order to find a good apical view, I'm going to change the orientation of my transducer such that the probe marker is pointing straight down towards the bed. The location of the cardiac apex is somewhat variable in patients, but it's generally more or less in the fourth or fifth intercostal space at about the level of the midclavicular line. In order to find it, though, I'm going to start a bit more lateral, and I'm going to move my transducer medially in a systematic fashion to try and find the spot with the best uh, cardiac apical window. As I slide my transducer, I'm watching the screen for cardiac structures to come into view. The first step in optimizing an apical image is to get the septum in the middle of the screen oriented vertically. This tells you that your transducer footprint is directly over the apex of the heart. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm missing some structures in the atria here, so I'm going to drop my depth substantially until I've got a better view. So here I've got a reasonable apical view. I'm going to decrease my depth a little bit to get only the structures I'm interested in on the screen, and I'm going to have a look here for, while the patient takes a couple breaths to watch how the heart moves with this respiratory cycle. What I want to see, ideally, is two elongated chambers with the mitral valve and tricuspid valve visible simultaneously and atria that don't appear cut off, rounded, or foreshortened. I'm just going to try and clean up that view a little bit here. And that's reasonable right there. So this structure is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. Mitral valve, left atrium, right atrium, and the tricuspid valve is intermittently visible there. Similar to the parasternal views, I'm looking at the distance from endocardium to endocardium, looking for uh, an adequate fractional shortening of that chamber, and I'm looking at the, endo the myocardium itself to see if it's thickening adequately. And that appears to be the case, again, in this healthy patient. At this point, I can't see the right ventricle very well. If I wanted to get a better look at the right ventricle, I could rotate my transducer on the patient's chest such that the beam was coming towards the right ventricle from that side. So I'm going to move my probe a little bit laterally, and this is going to allow me to better insinate the right ventricle. And now I can see its movement a little bit more clearly. Right ventricular function is much more nuanced to assess than left ventricular function, but there's a few components to it. There's both a longitudinal motion towards and away from the apex and a concentric 
contract contractile motion. The longitudinal motion can be assessed by looking at the uh, tricuspid valve annulus and how well it moves up and down. The concentric contraction of the RV can be assessed by looking at the RV free wall and seeing how well it moves inwards during systole. This view is a little bit foreshortened because I've had to optimize my window a little bit, but you can see clearly that the RV is, is functioning well both in terms of its uh, longitudinal and um, concentric contractility. One thing to note about the apical view is that it, it's very easy and frequent to flip into a five-chamber view. Here, I'm able to see a, a structure of some kind coming off the left ventricle towards the middle of the heart. This is the left ventricular outflow tract and aortic valve. If you see this view, it's not ideal for assessment of function, so you want to try to clean that up. Most of the time, it's a slight counterclockwise rotation and an angulation of the probe either towards or away from the patient's shoulder to close that off. The left ventricular outflow tract can be very useful for Doppler measurements and assessment of stroke volume, but that's a bit more of an advanced topic. Once I've gotten an adequate picture of the, uh, from the apical window, I would then switch to a subcostal view. Subcostal view is easily attained um, by sliding up from just above the patient's navel towards the xiphoid process. The transducer typically will be angulated slightly towards the left shoulder, and it's sometimes necessary to put the footprint of the probe slightly towards the patient's right so that you use the, the liver as an um, acoustic window towards the heart. It takes a little bit of downward pressure and upward tilt of the probe to bring the structures into view. Again, here I don't have enough depth, so I'm gonna increase it to more than I need, find the structures of interest, and then back off my depth to optimize things. The subcostal window is extraordinarily useful in the ICU. Many critically ill patients have very difficult parasternal or apical windows as a, as a consequence either of their positioning in bed or their intrinsic lung pathology. The subcostal view, though, is often preserved. Many things can be assessed from this view. Most importantly, it's the best view for identifying a pericardial effusion. In order to find an effusion on this view, you want to visualize the entire RV including the apex. This is the so-called seven sign where you can see the septal wall and the RV free wall meeting together at the apex. You're gonna angulate the probe all the way anterior and sweep through the entire heart looking for a fluid pocket between the RV free wall and the liver there. In other words, between it and the uh, pericardium. Effusions typically will collect in a gravity dependent fashion on the lower side as opposed to anterior although there are many exceptions. In this, in this case, there's no trace of an effusion whatsoever. Apart from effusion, this is a great window for assessing biventricular function because you often get a good view of both valves at the same time. Similar criteria to previous assessments apply when looking at ventricular function from this window. Finally, it's sometimes possible to achieve a short axis view from this window when it's not possible parasternally. In order to do that, I rotate the transducer 90 degrees so that the probe marker is facing completely upwards. And then I just angulate towards the patient's left shoulder. This gives me a similar donut-shaped appearance to the LV with the RV now on the top of the screen. This can sometimes be a very useful way to assess biventricular function when parasternal views aren't available. The last thing that can be seen from the subcostal window is the IVC. In order to achieve that, I will typically acquire a standard subcostal four-chamber view, turn my transducer 90 degrees so that, the tra so that the probe marker is facing the ceiling, and then I rotate the transducer like so, so that the handle is also facing the ceiling. This will usually bring the IVC into view on the screen. If it's more difficult to find, you can try to locate the right atrium and then follow that to find the large vessel that's draining into it. There's a incredible amount of debate uh, back and forth about the utility of the IVC in assessing shock states, fluid responsiveness, and so forth. I will identify it and leave it at there for future discussion. Uh, one unique scenario that often comes up in the setting of critical care ultrasound is how does one assess a patient with ultrasound during a cardiac arrest? Um, 
In general, the go-to view is gonna be a subcostal four chamber of the heart. What I recommend doing is, without getting in the way of the people doing chest compressions, get the transducer ready on the patient's abdomen so that you can quickly slide into a nice subcostal window during a pulse check. So I would leave my transducer roughly in the neighborhood here while they were doing CPR, and during a pulse check, quickly slide the transducer up to the subcostal zone and identify the heart. There's a few basic things you're looking for during CPR. Number one is a quickly reversible cause such as massive tamponade um, that can be fixed you know, at the time of the uh, cardiac arrest. Barring that, the next thing you wanna see is overall heart function. So identification of cardiac standstill is often um, used as a marker of whether or not CPR should continue or not. So if you're able to see ongoing cardiac activity despite a pulse that can't be felt, um, that may have prognostic implications as to how the code progresses from that point. Whereas if there's overt cardiac standstill, possibly even with thrombotic material in the ventricles, um, that may also be prognostically significant as to whether the cardiac arrest uh, resuscitation attempt should continue. And that is how I would use point-of-care ultrasound for a very basic cardiac assessment in the setting of shock. 